Hi, everyone. Welcome to our 10.30 a.m. press conference, Unusual Ocean Conditions, Conditions Contributed to Hurricane Harvey's Intensity. Our speakers this morning are Henry Potter from Texas A&M University, Stephen DeMarco from Texas A&M University, and Arnaldo V.A. Levinson from the University of Florida. Thank you very much. Okay, so the three points I want you to take home from this talk um, are going to be that we, we got lucky because we happened to be having a cruise for an unrelated issue in the Texas Bay a couple of weeks before Harvey struck. So we had a good, um, in, in, had good indication of what the water column looked like um, leading up to the storm. Um, the data show that the storm, that the water was very warm, which likely contributed to Harvey's rapid intensification. And um, the other thing that we found was that the tropical cyclone heat potential, which is a metric we'll talk about in a minute, was relatively low, suggesting that it's not a particularly useful metric for this particular case. Okay, so you've probably all seen uh, images like this many times before, but this is the Hurricane Harvey track. Um, and these numbers on the screen here, let me see, do I have a... No, that's not... No, no. Sorry, I was trying to... Okay, yes, yes, that's a good idea. So these numbers here indicate um, the intensification to the next category, right? So it turned into a category one here, and a two here, and a three here, and a four here. Now, uh, this is a close-up of this um, s section here that's marked with this black polygon. And this is where we made our measurements. This white dot here indicates where it turned into a uh, category four hurricane. So the measurements that I'm going to be talking about today occurred in this section here, right along the Texas coast, or the Texas Bight. And this, like I said, this is the area where the storm became a trop, trop, uh, category four, category four. Okay, so the way we made our measurements, we're using a CTD. CTD stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. So it's this uh, instrument here. These also have a bunch of cylinders in that collect water. I won't be talking about that. But basically, you, you put it over the side and it, it's lowered to the bottom and it measures the temperature of the water, the salinity of the water, and the depth of the water. This is uh, being deployed by a couple of students. We also had an Acrobat. This is a towed CTD. So this is basically the same thing as this, but it's towed through the water behind the ship. It undulates, it undulates. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down, and you can make measurements like that. And so each one of these dots here represent where we made a measurement with the CTD. And this gray line here represents one of the locations where we did our Acrobat tow. So that's where all the data was collected. I just wanted to show you a real quick video here of a CTD deployment. So this is off the back of the RV Manta. And you can see that uh, there's actually this is me and this is De uh, DeMarco. And we're just lowering uh, CTD over the back of the ship here. And what that'll do is it'll be lowered to the bottom and it'll collect the temperature salinity measurements. And then on the way up, it'll collect the water samples. So each one of the dots on the previous screen represent every time we, let, we deployed the CTD. So there were about 25 or so deployments over the duration of, uh, of the, each of the cruises. So this is the data from the CTD measurements on the left, and then the data from the Acrobat measurements on the right. So what, what I want you to take away from this is, so we did two, a cruise in June and a cruise in August. So this is sort of the beginning of hurricane season, and this was a couple of weeks before Harvey struck, right? Harvey struck right towards the end of August. And what I want you to take away from this, so we have depth here, and this is, the lo this is latitude and longitude. And here, this is, the, uh, this is the Texas coast here. And what I want to you to take away from this is that the water was considerably warmer in August than it was in June. It sort of stands to reason because it's been warming up over the summer, right? But warm, we have warm temperatures here about 30, 31 degrees um, in the top sort of 50 meters of the ocean during August. And in June, the temperatures weren't even close to that. They were maybe maxing out at about 27. And here's uh, the Acrobat data. There was an Acrobat tow that, was, that took place here and here. So these are more or less, in this. they weren't exactly the same location, but they're more or less the same location. And you can see that it tells the same, basically it tells the same story, that the amount of, the amount of heat, the temperature of the ocean was much, much warmer in August than it was in June, considerably warmer. And this uh, black line here, this marks the 26 degree isotherm. So this is where, this is how far below the surface you have to go to, before you get to the 26 degree temperatures. And so there's this one here, and then down here you can see that it's much lower in the water. That's going to make a little bit more sense in a minute. 
But what I want to tell you about this is that the total energy in the Texas bite in June was 7.05 times 10 to the neg to the power of 13 megajoules of energy. And then in August, it, in it had increased to 7.53 times 10 to the power of 13 megajoules, which is an increase of 4.8 times 10 to the power of 12 megajoules. I know these numbers seem a bit abstract, so I did some back of the envelope calculations. It turns out this increase of energy here that was um, present in the Texas bite in August that wasn't there in June is as much energy as every household in America consumes in one year. I, the numbers are mind-numbing, um, but that is, what I, that is what I discovered. Okay, so that, let, so that brings me to this idea of the tropical cyclone heat potential. So previously I showed you the water was a lot warmer in August, which is likely contributing to the, Harvey's rapid intensification, right? One of the metrics that is used by um, hurricane modelers is called the tropical cyclone heat potential, TCHP, and it's a metric used to estimate the energy in the ocean available to fuel a hurricane. It's defined as the integrated heat in the ocean above 26 degrees. So what that means is that, I talked about the 26 degree isotherm earlier, you go from the surface, you go all the way down until you reach the 26 degree isotherm. And then you figure out how much energy is in that layer of water that is in excess of 26 degrees. The idea being that if the, if the water is 26 degrees or warmer, then it's going to be warmer than the atmosphere and it's going to be able to provide fuel to the hurricane. Okay? And the, the general uh, consensus within the community is that if the tropical cyclone heat potential is above 90 kilojoules per centimeter squared, which is considered very high, then it's, it's been um, associated with very rapid intensification of hurricanes. So what we would expect to find, what I would have expected to find, would have been the tropical cyclone heat potential in the Texas Bight being 90 or higher. But as it turns out, the, um, the tropical, so this is just an example here of, the, uh, of how we would measure the tropical cyclone heat potential, and the same here. It turns out that the tropical cyclone heat potential in the Texas bite during August, just before the storm came through, was only 36 kilojoules per centimeter squared. So what this tells me is that this idea of the tropical cyclone heat potential being a useful metric to predict rapid intensification of a storm was not valid in this case. Now, I'm not sure the reason for that. It may be because it's in coastal waters. There may be other things going on that I, that I haven't explored. But a number of 90 or above is normally associated with rapid intensification. We had numbers here of 36. Despite that, we still had a rapid intensification. Okay, so just to summarize, the Texas Bay was extremely warm in August. It's unlikely that Harvey would have intensified so rapidly if it had come earlier in the season. Hurricanes that occur at the height of summer have the greatest amount of heat available to them and greatest potential for intensification, becoming more dangerous to coastal communities. And despite the high temperatures, the tropical cyclone heat potential was much lower than the values normally associated with potential for rapid intensification. This suggests that the tropical cyclone heat potential is not ideal in shallow water environments or there were other things going on that I haven't um, explored. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, so Henry just talked a bit about, uh, so my name's Steve DeMarco and I'm a professor at oceanography, of oceanography at Texas A&M University. I'm also the ocean observing team lead for the geochemical and environmental research group. Uh, so Henry just talked to you about some of the intensification issues that, uh, that we uncovered during uh, Harvey, but I'm gonna talk about a bit of the oceanic response uh, post Harvey. So, uh, so we run a system called the Texas Automated Buoy System. It's uh, known affectionately as TABS, and uh, this uh, picture here just shows uh, a deployment uh, crews uh, in the past showing some of the buoys uh, that, that go off the Texas coast, and I'll, I'll, show, I'll explain a little bit more about them in a second here. So Har Harvey, uh, as Henry just said, uh, uh, Im impacted the Texas coast 
It made landfall on the 25th of August near Rockport, uh, Texas. That's, uh, that image shows uh, essentially that landfall about the time of the, of the landfall. There was also, after it, it made landfall, it went back to sea and then made a second landfall near Cameron, uh, Louisiana, uh, a couple hundred miles to the east. Uh, but of course, uh, the, a lot of the news was uh, the intense flooding that occurred in Houston uh, and uh, the somewhat uh, on the order of 18 trillion gallons uh, or a couple of, uh, of cubic kilometers worth of water fell onto uh, the Houston uh, downtown area and surrounding areas. Uh, that map on the right shows uh, the, uh, the amount of inches of rain that, that fell. Uh, but of course, what happens is all that fresh water has to go somewhere. So uh, in this part of the world, it goes out into the coastal environment and impacts uh, uh, the offshore uh, ecosystems that are, that are there. And, and so uh, the motivation for our work then became what was the uh, uh, all that terrestrial fresh water and the contaminants uh, that were in, inside that fresh water. A lot of people's homes were flooded, and so there's, uh, you know, uh, antifreeze in people's garages. Uh, there is uh, oil and gas in people's cars, I and mean, half a million cars were flooded in, in Houston. So all that effluent has to get out, and so we were then tracking where that goes because it <coughs> posed a threat to the coastal eco ecosystems off of Texas. And uh, one uh, in particular is the flower gardens National Marine Sanctuary, which is 100 miles offshore. Uh, it's the stunningly beautiful coral reef that's just south of Texas. So, uh, so our idea was let's take a look at that. So just a word about the Texas Automated Buoy System. It's funded by the Texas General Land Office. Its primary mission really is to look at oil spill in which there's often spills in, in Texas and they have to set up their cleanup. So our system's out continuously operating. It's doing that for 24-7. It's at these different locations along the coast. They're in green here. That They range from all the way from Brownsville all the way up to the Sabine uh, at the Texas-Louisiana border. There's eight coastal buoys. There's two at the Flower Garden Banks. They mostly measure temperature and salinity, but we also have autonomous vehicles that include the liquid robotics uh, wave glider. It's a surface vehicle, and also the uh, Teledyne Web ocean uh, buoyancy gliders that go up and down in the water column. So, uh, so this is, a, a, I'm going to go right to the animation here. So this is just showing uh, the winds and the currents at the time of Harvey. So you can see the, uh, the, the track make landfall. You can see the ocean responding uh, to the winds. You can see, uh, or the winds responding uh, to the hurricane, then the uh, ocean currents responding to the winds. Uh, you can see it made landfall and then it's coming back out. Uh, you can see the little symbol coming back out along the coast. You can see it take a jog to the east. Uh, it's about to go back in and it's about, and then it doesn't quite want to go back in. It comes back out offshore and then it goes in near Cameron, that's near Lake Charles, Louisiana. So you can see all those uh, things going on. This is just a picture of, bu of a buoy here that I thought I'd put in uh, because it's the ocean after all and things grow in the ocean so it's covered with barnacles after we, we recovered it. Uh, this shows here just a, a, uh, the, the currents at the time of the landfall. So it's a little bit busy, but I just want to walk you through a little bit. So these are the different uh, locations. These are time series. So what's on the x-axis here is just time. Uh, each uh, black vector here is the magnitude and direction of where the currents are going towards. And you can see I, 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 I showed in red here uh, the time which uh, the hurricane made its uh, first landfall, and then this, uh, in blue, it's when the hurricane made its second landfall. And you can see that the ocean here, so these are ocean currents, uh, they're, they're moving at uh, upwards of a, of a knot or two. Uh, in fact, the, the maximum speed was here at this buoy D, which is right here. Uh, D uh, reached uh, three knots, and that's the record for, uh, in the 20 years that I've been looking at the data from this particular location, that's the strongest current, surface current, that we've ever seen on the Texas coast, 160 centimeters per second, about three knots. Uh, so you can see uh, as the hurricane went in and then uh, came back out and, and then went in again that the currents along the coast were responding to that. But uh, following the, current, uh, the hurricane uh, here, there was very strong, and, and, and what's, what I also say here is that if the currents are pointing up, it's going towards Louisiana, and if they're going down, they're going towards Mexico, and so these are all just corrected for along the coast here. So uh, at this location, or at this time here, which is about uh, the 5th to the 10th of September, the currents were very strongly 
towards Mexico, and that was really what was driving where that fresh water is. It made itself out onto the coastal environment. Where is it going to go? It's being pushed by winds, and it's being pushed towards Mexico. So uh, all of our buoys had salinity measurements on them, so it's where the, where's the fresh water? You can measure that through the salinity. So low salinity meant fresh water. And so what I'm um, showing here in that second panel, it says fresh water immediately impacts uh, the coastal Texas environment. These are buoys uh, R and B and F. These are the upper coast, so these are uh, up here by Galveston. And so the, if the landfall was here at 25th to the 26th, you see almost immediate impact uh, here at, uh, at these locations. And then uh, as, as the salinity gets uh, progressively uh, 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 smaller, you can see the phasing, the relative phasing of that as the different buoys gets, get impacted. Uh, we did some uh, calculations of how fast that would have been, uh, how fast it would, was getting offshore in these locations, and it's about 50 centimeters per second, which is about one nautical mile per hour, which is consistent with what the currents were uh, showing. Uh, down coast, uh, so these are the sou southern buoys, so this is down here at this uh, location near Corpus Christi and near uh, uh, the Rio Grande near Brown Brownsville. Uh, we see uh, that it took uh, more than a week for uh, the salinities to adjust, and that's because the, it was the currents were responding to the winds, which were driving that down coast uh, uh, movement of that freshwater uh, plume as it went down, as it went down coast. So, uh, so the same crews uh, one, uh, that, that Henry was showing uh, earlier, we also were ma mapping the freshwater distribution on the, on, along the coast. And you can see here, so this is right after Harvey, so this is uh, September 22nd, that the freshwater here uh, it was in the teens, and that's very unusual for this time of year. And uh, it's usually much higher than that in the 20s. And so we're seeing teens out here, and it's stretching all the way down coast, which is extremely unusual for that to be occurring all the way down to South Padre and, and, and towards uh, the Mexican border. Out of the flower garden banks, though, uh, the salinities remained really high. They're at 35, 36 uh, parts per thousand is what the unit uh, would be uh, relative here. And, and we see that the, uh, that the threat that we had thought was going to happen earlier uh, when we first uh, were thinking about it never made it out to the flower garden banks, which was, in our view, a very good thing because the threat to the ecosystem was, uh, was not there. Uh, but how do we know that? Well, we made the measurements. Uh, we also have uh, the, the surface vehicles, uh, the, the liquid robotics vehicle was, was deployed right about here in that time and also was patrolling this area and we also, the data from that, which I, I'm not going to show in this talk, the data from that show very clearly that the, the plume, the freshwater plume stayed inshore of the, that location. We did, however, put a, because we're very worried about the water quality in this area, uh, we did put this, this is a uh, slocum glider at the surface uh, and showing it there in that top panel. Uh, it goes up and down in the water column and we were measuring oxygen concentration and the, the view here is all that fresh water is going to impact the amount of oxygen in, in the water and that can affect the ecosystem health as well. So, uh, so what you see here is, uh, so the oxygen concentration as a time series going up and down in the water here. Um, but the map is here. This is showing the location of, of this trajectory where the glider actually went. And this here is uh, showing uh, vertically through the water column. And so what you see is the low oxygens tended to be near the, near the bottom. That's consistent with this uh, very strong stratification or the salt water uh, sitting underneath the fresh water, which was about 20 meters thick. And so how do we know that? We made the measurement. So you only get this. You can't get this from satellite. The only way you know this kind of observation is by putting things into the water. Uh, so I just want to talk about heroism for a second here because uh, in order to get data, you have to put people out at, in harm's way in order to, uh, to collect that data. And the, the, there was four of our technicians were actually on this boat. This is the same boat that was in the first slide, by the way, but it's just 24 hours after the made, they made landfall. Uh, the, uh, the buoy crew, crew had to endure eight meter seas, and there's the data uh, showing the eight meter seas uh, as measured by the TABS buoy system. Uh, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, these guys uh, worked really hard uh, to get those uh, instruments in the water as the storm was coming uh, on them. Uh, there was just a, uh, a typical maintenance crews to, to, to refurbish the buoys that were out. However, they, uh, they got those buoys in and the ship lost some uh, engines 
and they, uh, so they were limping back to shore. When they make category four status, the entire coastline shuts down. You can't get into any port at that point. So they just turned the bow of the ship into the winds and they just endured. And this picture here is uh, 24 hours after the, the storm made landfall, but it was the first time that uh, Adam, who was the technician on duty, was able to stand on the boat. So this is the first, really the first picture during the storm. Uh, my conclusion here is that, uh, that these in situ observations reveal the environment, they're the proof that you made the measurement. So uh, you only get that by putting things in the water. Uh, we got these observations during, uh, throughout uh, Harvey in real time, and so they were really the eyes and the ears uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the ocean during this, during this event. Uh, it tracked the, the plume uh, movement uh, all the way down the Texas coast and towards Mexico. Uh, and it did not get to the flower garden banks uh, as we had originally had feared. And so, uh, and so we were able to track that and, and, and the data show it did not get to the flower garden banks. Uh, there's others at this research, uh, in, in fact, some of them are in this room right now who will be talking about the impact of the biology and to the biogeochemistry of that shelf uh, as a response to this. We track the, the movement of that fresh water. That's what we were interested in. Others are looking at the, uh, the other impacts in, uh, to the biology and chemistry. There was a lot of people involved with this, and there's lots of different agencies associated with this, but I would just like to point out that a lot of the industry also helped out uh, in, in rapid response to help us get these instruments out, and that includes uh, Liquid Robotics, who put the, uh, helped us get the, our, our wave glider out, and that tracked where the plume is going during the time of the, uh, the, 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 uh, of the, the, the response. So anyway, uh, that's all. Thank you. All right, so my, my name is Arnoldo Valle Levinson, and uh, I will tell you that my, my main message as we move further inland from where they were talking about into Galveston Bay and Houston is that the, the hurricane uh, produced a one, two, three punch into the, in, in Houston, so it was one, two, three, and it knocked out Houston for almost six, seven days. Right? Uh, one, one punch came from the Buffalo Bayou that runs through Houston, and that's a, <clears throat> it became a river, not a bayou. And then we, we had a, another punch from the San Jacinto River, and the third punch came from the ocean. Right, so I'm, I'll tell you about those three punches. And what motivated us to look into this is that uh, when you look at the water level in the city of Houston, this, in the last 10 years, this is what you find. And what you observed during Hurricane Harvey was that the highest in the uh, last 10 years at least, NPR has declared that this has been the most significant, as they call it, most significant tropical storm in, uh, in the history of the United States entirely, in terms of the amount of rain that it, it produced. But not only that, not only this peak that caused a tremendous amount of flooding, Houston was preconditioned by flooding in early August. So that was the eighth most, the, the eighth largest flooding in the last 10 years. So Houston was already preconditioned to flooding before um, Harvey hit it. Uh, in some places of the city of Houston, the rain was uh, uh, one, one and a half meters, so more than five feet. That's, that's just uh, unimaginable, unimaginable. So that, and uh, so as I was saying, the, those two peaks are uh, what indicate the, the, the actual storm and the preconditioning. Pre All right, so to understand the, the one, two, three punch, the, what happened in Houston, we need to zoom in, in a little bit to the Houston area and look at the, the Blue Bayou area, uh, Blue Bayou. <laughs> The Buffalo Bayou area, <laughs> which is, uh, it runs through Houston. It has several tributaries that go, smaller tributaries that uh, come into it, but this is one of the main avenues from Houston to, the, to Galveston Bay and then to the Gulf of Mexico. And then you have San Jacinto River. 
Notice that San Jacinto River is connected to Lake Houston there. In Lake Houston, at the southern edge, you have a, a dam. So water overtopped that dam and created a, a very large river here in the San Jacinto River. <clears throat> so let's see what happened in, uh, in the city of Houston with the, with the gauges, water level gauges from the USGS. So all the data that I'm showing you are from either USGS or from NOAA. So we didn't have to go out and collect data. Those data are being recorded in real time and you can, you can actually get this data as things are happening. So if we look at, uh, at the city of Houston, and some of the gauges of the USGS, see th these are grouped with the yellow color here are shown in this upper panel. And then these blue colored circles are related to these two uh, records. This goes from uh, August 25 to 30th of uh, last year. And what you see, I mean, th there are lots of things going on here, but I want you to focus only on those two pulses in which the, the level of the bayous in the city of Houston went up sort of synchronously, but then there was a largest, the largest peak later on, at, uh, late on the 27th of August. And what's significant here is that the water level remained high for several days. It couldn't go out. Uh, and also, what's significant here, when you look then at San Jacinto River, uh, the, the water level at those two gauges look like that. Notice that the peak was reached more than two days later than in Houston. So this suggests uh, one punch from the Buffalo Bayou and another punch later from uh, the San Jacinto River. <clears throat> The way that happens is more or less as, follow, as follows. If we zoom in to the confluence of the Buffalo Bayou that comes in here, and then the San Jacinto River, notice you have water going out, trying to go out, go out all the water that fell in Houston, trying to go out to the ocean through, through this passage. And all the water that fell in uh, uh, that, uh, that overf overflowed the, Hudson, uh, the Houston Lake, trying to go out this way. Where will it go? It sort of converged right around this area. That's the only passage that, that those two pulses uh, found when they wanted to go out. So a great part of the pulse that came from San Jacinto backflowed into Houston. So that's what kept the waters high in Houston, this double punch. So that's a one-two punch here that uh, affected uh, Houston. And it's not, not only that, if you go further seaward toward Galveston Bay, the water that, the water that makes, through, makes it through that passage has to go somewhere. The only passage is through there, another very narrow passage. So two bottlenecks for the water that fell into Houston, onto Houston to go out to the, to the ocean, just through those two passages. When you look at, the, um, <clears throat> at Galveston Bay and look at water level data now from the bicolor lollipops that you see there, those are the stations from NOAA. And you can group them in, uh, in the, what happens in Manchester, which is in the city of Houston. It's that uh, dark brown line that you see here, the, the one with the largest uh, level. So these are water levels. So notice that almost three meters, almost nine feet. <clears throat> so that created a, a, an extended period of flooding. Then when you go to uh, Lynchburg Landing, it's the red line. You had a peak, and the sensor sort of failed right there. And it has been uh, out of order since. But then when you go to the other stations as you move seaward, all the other stations, Morgan Point, which is the uh, orange line that you don't see there, but you, you see all, those, all the other lollipop stations, they, they all group out, group together. As the, the variations throughout the, the whole estuary were very similar. There was a very rapid change from, as you see from uh, Morgan's Point, to Lynchburg Landing, and that's through that passage that I was showing you before, the bottleneck that was created by the two, two punches from the two rivers from the Buffalo Bayou and from San Jacinto River. All right, so during this period, the water was uh, elevated uh, at, the, at the seaward stations, at the transition from the estuary to the ocean. When you look at currents in the uh, Galveston Bay, and you go to the blue lollipop now, that's a, a point where NOAA measures currents. Uh, this is what happens during uh, the period from 
August 21 to September 6th. Uh, the area shaded in yellow here indicates that water was going to the ocean. So any time that the, the blue line is in the yellow area, it means that water was going toward the ocean. And so before the, the hurricane, which is this, this time, you see the tides going in, in and out the bay. But during the influence of the hurricane, that is the fresh water coming out, there's only water going out. So you had a period of more than f four days in which water didn't go into Galveston, Galveston Bay. It was only going out. But it wasn't going out very fast, even though uh, the currents there were more than five knots. Uh, if you go further up into the bay, and those are the, the red symbols now, you see that before the hurricane, right around this period, the blue lines are, have a larger excursion than the red line. So that means that the currents were much greater here than here. So there was an attenuation of the signal, signal as, as the tides moved from this point to that point, from the mouth to the head. But during the hurricane, the reverse happened. The currents right around the head exceeded seven knots. And this dash line that you see there is because the, there was some uh, issue with the communication with the instrument. I was told recently, well today, that indeed there are data av available here and that the currents exceeded seven knots during that period. Uh, whereas at the mouth they just reached uh, five knots. So, so now the currents were much stronger here than here, so the signal attenuated in this direction. So the, fa so the fact that the currents decreased from this point to that point means that the ocean was preconditioning the system and keeping the water a little longer in the system, in, the Galveston, in Galveston Bay and in Houston. Right? So the ocean was playing that role <clears throat> during that period. Okay, so that was the third punch, one, two, three punch. The, the last preconditioning that uh, exacerbated the three punch came from the fact that uh, we're experiencing a period of relatively high sea level compared to other times in the history. So if you look at the last century of sea level throughout the Gulf of Mexico that you see here, you see different stations that NOAA has in the Gulf of Mexico from Port Isabel, Port, uh, Port Isabel which is this line, going around to Key West, which is the uppermost line. This is, these are sea levels. That is, this is uh, the measurements of the tides. One we once we el eliminate the variations of the tides and seasonal variations in the water level. So these are interannual variations of sea levels. It, this tells you about sea, sea level rise. We have also eliminated the long-term trend because each one of these lines show a trend of increasing what you've heard about sea level rise. So we've eliminated that. But this is just to show, I want you to focus on the last part of this graph, which is the, uh, very busy. When you look at the stations in Texas and Louisiana, sea level has been anomalously high. So if, if you have a, an anomalously high sea level, that sort of hinders anything that wants to come out of uh, Galveston Bay and Houston to come up more easily. So, so the ocean was preconditioning uh, the flooding in Houston and in Galveston Bay. So I think this is very important because it's the, an influence of sea level rise on, uh, uh, on the response of the hurricane, it created a higher baseline over which the storm surge and the flooding occurred. All right, so in summary, we have the one punch from the Buffalo Bayou, two punch from San Jacinto River, and the third punch from the ocean. So that's a one, two, three punch that knocked out Houston for six or seven days. It, it's, it's recovering now of the knockout, but Okay, great, thank you. Um, are there any questions from reporters in the room? Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, I'm Megan Siever with Earth Magazine. Um, I had a couple questions for you, Dr. DeMarco. Um, how far offshore are you talking about the plume sort of going? I know it didn't reach the 100 miles of the, the flower gardens. How far did it reach? That's the first question. The second one you may not want to answer, but that was what did you find in terms of contaminants? Yeah, so it, um, uh, the seaward extension of that plume was about 30 to 35 meters off, offshore, so it, it uh, didn't, did, uh, miles. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, 
But, uh, and, so, and, and so it didn't get offshore uh, to the flower garden banks. Uh, the contaminants, others are looking, I'm not a, uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't give justice to the, uh, the biogeochemistry. Uh, uh, I'll be right at the edge of my limit of uh, insanity with that. So, uh, but there are people definitely looking at that uh, because there is uh, material mobilized uh, throughout the Houston area and uh, there has been uh, work with our group uh, to look at that. Are there any? Um, for Henry Potter. You talked about the uh, uh, tropical cyclone heat potential, TCHP, which uh, measures the uh, to total heat contained within the volume of the upper ocean. Um, it seems surprising that that measurement uh, did, not, did not support the other measurements that in the upper, in the upper parts of the uh, Gulf off the Texas coast, um, temperatures were higher in, in all your other measurements. Um, are you surprised? Do you have a, are you, are you surprised or co confounded by the, by the fact that the, this measurement, TCHP, is not, is surprisingly not high enough to support the uh, tropical cyclone potential? And do you, do you have uh, an inkling as to why? Yeah, so my feeling is that um, when you get close to the coast, the tropical cyclone heat potential is not really a particularly good metric to use because what happens is when you uh, estimate the tropical cyclone heat potential, what you do is you figure out how much energy is in the ocean. You go from the surface and you go down until you hit the 26 degree isotherm and then you figure out how much energy above 26 degrees is in, the, is in that layer of water. So normally it's it's restricted by the depth of the 26 degree isotherm. But because we're close to the coast, we never hit the 26 degree isotherm. Therefore, the amount of energy that we were able to estimate available for the storm was restricted just because it was shallow water, right? Because if, the, if, it, hadn't been, if, the, if it hadn't been so shallow, then presumably the depth of the 26 degree isotherm would have been much greater than the depth of the actual water. So in that regard, I would say that when you get close to the coast, this uh, idea of tropical cyclone heat potential is probably not a sensible metric to use. Uh, Carolyn Gramling, um, Science News Magazine. I, I just wanted to follow up on that. So how close to the coast are we talking about that that would be poten potentially not a useful metric? Um, well, the mixed layer is normally, let's see, so let's say you want to say about, probably the 26 degree isotherm might fall that time of year around a depth of about 50 meters perhaps. I don't actually know. DeMarco, do you know how far off coast you need to get before you get to a depth of about 50 meters? Do you have any sense of that? It's, it's about, um, yeah, that's, I guess I was going to volunteer that uh, it's a wide Texas shelf, right? So, uh, so if you're if you're on the maybe on the east coast maybe the um, the, the shelf's not so wide but but here it's it's wide and depending on where you are it's in in the center of the, the Texas shelf it's 70 miles to get to the 50 meter isobath it's about 40 or uh, 50 miles to get to it uh, in that in that location where the landfall was. Thank you, Rick Lovett, freelance. Um, can we, uh, what can we learn about this for other hurricanes elsewhere, not just Harvey, but you know, like I'm, I'm thinking particularly like about the Pacific, um, Taiwan, which has gotten some ferocious rainstorms. I don't know how they compare to this, um, um, but but to generalize this to globally. Well, certainly, I would say that um, the data that I have shown you today suggests that the ocean was really warm. It was really warm. And it's, it's generally well understood that if you have a warm ocean, you, it's going to lead to stronger storms and rapid intensification of storms. So on a global perspective, I would say as long as we have continue to have long, hot summers and the climate continues to change, then I would imagine that it would lead to more intense storms, tropical storms across the globe. Doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be more frequent, but certainly I would I would believe that they'd be more intense. Yeah. So I, I think that um, it, this uh, at least the two things that we were uh, presenting 
just uh, underscores the, the importance for having uh, oceanic observations. And so uh, a lot of the, um, uh, the models aren't particularly tuned with having an ocean component to them. And so uh, we feel that we're supplying the, the ocean side of, of the data in order to have that uh, uh, part uh, represented uh, so that, it's like oh, I was trying to say, the, uh, these are the proof you made the measurement, right? So there are the actual observations that, that are out there and uh, they need to be incorporated within the numerical modeling schemes in order to get that heat content from the ocean uh, uh, into these intensification. We, we get the, uh, we get trajectory pretty good, but it's the intensification problem is the big problem. Yeah, I would like to add to that uh, the, this uh, double punch that floods cities during uh, extreme events can happen in, in uh, several places. Here, Portland is one example. You have the Willamette River and the uh, Columbia River. So whenever there's a, a, a freshet, so you don't need a hurricane. Just you need a, a, a big pulse, an anomalously large pulse, and it doesn't have to be from rain here. It can be rain from uh, in the mountains or the freshet in the spring. Uh, water can backflow from the Willamette to Portland and flood it. It happened in the late 19th century. Tremendous flooding, and that was the, that was a similar response. So uh, w whenever you have a system with two rivers sort of competing to flush out. One will block out the other and will uh, cause flooding. Besides, if, if you are cl relatively close to the ocean, the ocean can precondition that flooding by sort of re uh, delaying the flushing of the uh, flooding waters. Hi, uh, Janessa Duncombe, Freelance. Um, I have a question for Dr. Potter. Um, so you mentioned that uh, the ocean was a lot warmer comparing, you know, June to August. Um, could you compare that August temperature to past Augusts or an average August you would expect? Um, that, that's, a, that's something that could possibly be done. I haven't done it. So the difference here between, pre so, so there are products that are made available from satellite that give an idea of how warm, the, well, you could, from a satellite you can tell how warm the surface of the ocean is, but you can't tell how warm it is below the surface. Um, and the other thing you can do from satellite is get a, get a sort of an estimate of how much heat is in the ocean, but it doesn't tell you, and that's from an altimeter, but it doesn't tell you where that heat is. So it doesn't tell you if it's at the top of the ocean or at the bottom of the ocean, right? So. So it is possible to do comparisons, which I haven't done, but I will do. Um, but it, it wouldn't be an apples to apples comparison because this is, year is unique in as much as that we have the observational data, which gives us a much more intricate look of where, not only what the temperature was, but where the heat was. Right? So it's, it's, it's a possible comparison to make, but it, like I say, it wouldn't be apples to apples. Thanks, Big and Seaver with Earth again. Um, are you guys working with, you know, the modelers at like NOAA and National Weather Service, NASA, et cetera? I imagine, you know, if you're finding that this um, TCHP isn't working well, they'd want to know that for, for forecasting. I just wondered if they had been contacting you or how that relationship was going. Well, I haven't been in touch with them personally, but of course, everything that we do gets, makes it into the uh, peer-reviewed literature and eventually it trickles down to the modelers who use this information to improve their models, yeah. So, something to add to that, the, uh, all, the, all the tabs, buoy data are, are streamed live to the GTS, so it goes on the, the global uh, uh, service, telecommunication service, so it, it does uh, get into the, the, the National Weather Service models uh, that way from the surface uh, point of view. Uh, we're st with the glider data that we're putting in is just now starting to be incorporated in some of these global, uh, the, the national glider DAC and, and, and so forth. So uh, uh, there is uh, a, a Texas uh, uh, state sponsored uh, uh, model for that shell, numerical circulation model for that shelf. And the model did not, I didn't show it, but the model did not do particularly well for that uh, because it doesn't assimilate any ocean data. Michael Fortune Climate Science Forum, mainly for um, Dr. Potter. 
You mentioned uh, measurements were taken in mid-June and uh, 7 to 11 August, two weeks before Harvey. And as I understand it, they were measurements at depth. They were, they were, uh, could, could be translated as heat content. Were, were any of these measurements available to either the National Weather Service or NOAA or other authorities in Texas? The, the measurements were not made available, no. And it's not because we were um, trying to keep them from people, but between all, but by the, from the time that we made the measurements in August, and, and the, the amount of time it takes to quality control the data and make it available to ourselves, um, to convince ourselves that it's right and it passes all the quality control m metrics and stuff like that is a reasonably arduous process that takes several weeks. So it would have been premature to say, we've just collected this data and just sent it out into the world before that we were sure that what we had was uh, a true reflection of the conditions at the time. Can I add to that? Yeah. So, uh, uh, so I'm uh, co-PI of that uh, part of the project um, mm -hmm. that got the funding before the storm. And uh, that was funded through the, uh, the Restore Act, Texas Center for Excellence, uh, one, the Texas One Golf Center for Excellence. So it's part of the Restore uh, uh, oil spill money that, that came to Texas. And it was to look at water quality, essentially water quality on the Texas coast. So it was really serendipitous. <laughs> that uh, we had that, uh, those, those series of cruises before the hurricane. It was mostly designed to look at upwelling along the Texas coast and how that affected water quality. But it just turns out that we got some really good uh, quality heat content data as well, and at the, I think at the appropriate uh, scales, too. Are there any other questions? Rick Lovett again, a follow-up to my prior question. Um, when I'm, I'm wondering whether there are other parts of the world, I'm kind of interested in the hazard here from the pollution. Um, that was, that was a, a new idea to me. Um, and are there other parts of the world that might be at risk of having coral reefs or other critical ecosystems um, messed up this way? And for uh, Dr. Potter, um, are there other parts of the world where there are shallow, like does the Philippines have, a, I think there's a lot of shallow water out there. Does that mean we need to rethink our models there or Indonesia or I, I, if uh, when one of these things take same as it or to Queensland or if, it, if they go that far south? Yeah, certainly. I, I'm not um, an expert on global bathymetry, so I can't tell you where all the shallow shelves are across the globe, but I would say certainly anywhere that there's a, a sh shallow shelf um, would have issues with the using this tropical cyclone heat potential metric to feed their models. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, uh, I'm not a PI of the project, but um, but uh, our institute uh, just was recently awarded in in May a uh, a, a contract with the NIH, uh, a Superfund site for for Galveston, and the and the idea. So the it's really ironic because. The idea was, what if uh, there was a direct hit on Galveston and uh, it remobilizes all the sediment there and puts all that uh, effluent then into uh, people's yards, right, or their houses? And, uh, but really, the, this, the, like the exact opposite thing happened with Harvey. It, it rained uh, a tremendous amount, and that caused the flooding. The flooding really didn't come in, in as we just saw. Uh, the flooding comes from uh, the terrestrial side, but all that that uh, sediment uh, got remobilized and, and put into the, uh, into the water, and then it got distributed again. So uh, again, I'm not the PI of that project. I'm not even affiliated with that project, but it is one that's in, at our institute, and uh, they're thinking heavily about that because there's contaminants that were re-suspended re re and, and moved around. So it's a, it, this is a big question, and, and, and uh, especially in these urban areas where you have sites that ha have contaminants that could harm people. So people's well-being uh, could be in jeopardy. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Okay, are there any questions on the chat? Okay, great, that concludes our press conference. Thank you very much.